Why, hello there, everybody, and welcome back to the GSL English podcast. My name is, of course, Gideon. And in this week's episode, once again, we have a very special guest joining us. It was my pleasure to have a conversation with Avery from Arc English. So don't worry, you're not stuck with me talking to myself for another week. No, instead, I had a very interesting conversation with Avery about a wide variety of different topics. We spoke about life in Canada, the winter there, as it can be very tough. We also spoke about going to university and getting a scholarship in Canada and playing professional basketball. Of course, Avery, not me. But also, we we spoke about the difficulties when learning any language, but also how to learn English, particularly in a natural and authentic way. And Avery gave some absolutely brilliant advice. So before the conversation starts, I do have one apology to make. So I noticed, I think, about five to seven minutes into recording with Avery, I hadn't transferred my microphone over. As always, I acted in a very unprofessional way. So you might notice at the beginning, my audio quality is not perfect. That is my fault. I forgot to switch my microphone over to this one. So you might notice it changed. Of course, Avery was extremely professional. But just so you know, if the audio quality is bad at the beginning, on my part, and then gets better, that's exactly why. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of tea and enjoy my conversation with Avery. So Avery, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Very good. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm happy to uh, speak with a fellow English teacher. So um, yeah, happy to be here. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to our conversation and especially thank you for taking the time on the weekend as well. Uh, oh, of course. that. Of course. Yeah, of course. Um, I love doing it. Uh, I love uh, helping people learn English as a second language, showing them um, our native language and all the complicated nuances with it as well. <laughs> so it uh, should be fun. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, actually, hearing about kind of your approach to teaching and we can just see where we both stand on different things. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, how, how do you normally spend your weekends? Probably not doing a random podcast, but what do you normally like? Oh, to man. Do? So I actually work a lot. Um, oh, okay. I, on social media, I help people learn English. I'm totally doing this on a, the side with another full-time job. Oh, wow. Uh, so I actually usually spend my spare time, uh, doing this. So, um, it's on the weekends. I try to get outside when the weather's good. I live in Canada. So for about half of the year, the weather is pretty bad, Right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no consists of working out, helping people with their English and then working. Um, and I am a creature of habit, very routine. Okay. So you like kind of your routine sticking to it and, and that's it. Pretty much, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Slight tweaks here or there, but yeah, yeah. more or less the same thing. <laughs> I'm the same. I've noticed it particularly as I get older, more and more. So I'm just, if anything touches my routine, then I go into like a spiral. <laughs> Absolutely. I completely understand <laughs> how yeah. that feels. I mean, I didn't know that this was kind of, um, you've done remarkably well in your uh, your social media and your English teaching, but I didn't know that was more of a side kind of project for you. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was completely on the side. Um, I probably started around two years ago mm. and uh, I just started making uh, videos on TikTok when TikTok first came out, actually. Oh, wow. At the very beginning, yeah. Cool. And um yeah, no, eventually people liked the videos. They said it helped their vocabulary a lot. It took off and I just kept doing it um, and it kept uh, growing. And yeah, that's it. That's it. Wow. I'm really, I'm, well, that's made me even more interested in your story. I'm looking forward to kind of catching that um, mm -hmm. in a moment. So you said you're in Canada right yes. now and it's been, it's been winter. How's, how's the winter been in Canada? Because I know they're quite grueling at times. Yeah, it, it depends where in Canada. Right. If you're on the western side in Vancouver, you don't get too much snow. It just rains a lot, um, mm -hmm. similar to what I've heard of London. I heard it rains a lot there, too. But um, 
if you go over to the central part of Canada where I'm from and then the eastern side um from around November until about May it's mm -hmm. going to be very cold <laughs> oh wow very very cold um it can get down to below 30 degrees Celsius with the wind chill um <laughs> and it's yeah you it's not really safe to be outside some days in the worst parts of the winter so actually uh people who don't live in Canada what they may see is during the winter months a lot of Canadians who can afford it actually do travel to uh warmer <laughs> places in the world and um uh, that's basically our time to uh our prime time to travel. <laughs> yeah, I, minus 30. That's, yeah. um, I complain in England when it gets to about minus two. I think, no, nope, yeah. not going outside. But minus 30, that's the next level. Yeah, it's next level. So um, Canadians are humbled uh, very quickly <laughs> with, the, <laughs> with the winter. That's interesting what you say, actually, because um, <laughs> I used to live out in the Dominican Republic. Um, mm -hmm. I've gone on about it loads in the podcast, so listeners will know. But... Um, a lot of the time, actually, around that time of year, we would get an influx of, of Canadians joining mm -hmm. us there and they would kind of come for a certain three, yeah. four months and then they would yeah. head. So I guess that's the reason why, just to get away yeah. from winter. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the Caribbean yeah. islands, uh, the southern parts of the United States, Mexico. It's all uh, extremely popular with Canadians um, going there in December, January, February. My dad actually just ditched Canada for like uh, the months of December, January and February. Uh, just recently and uh yeah it's it's, it's commonplace <laughs> okay well it's pretty it makes sense doesn't it so yeah. if, it's, if it gets that cold and how do you go about your daily kind of routine because it's that, that's that's difficult isn't it yeah well i mean when you're work yeah you just come out of your house into your car <laughs> get to work get into the office and then you never go outside again yeah. um and uh you, you just try to limit the amount of time that you're outside there's some Canadians, I don't know how they do it, don't ask me, but they love the outdoors in the winter. They love going skating outdoors. They love going skiing and snowboarding outdoors, even in cold weather. I could, I don't have the tolerance or the patience for that. Um, I would be in pain, but uh, a lot of Canadians embrace that, actually. So uh, it's, it's, just, it's interesting. Yeah. It's part of who they are. They, they embrace yeah, that side of their... Uh, I guess so, culture. yeah. yeah. Because actually, I mean, I don't know if I can go as far to say as I'm a snowboarder. I'll say I like snowboarding. I've been mm. about three times. <laughs> but I know one of the um, the kind of the meccas or the place to go to was Canada, you know, snowboarding. Mm. I never yeah. I never made it, but I know it's huge over there, isn't it? In, in winter. Yep. Especially in the uh, area with the mountains in uh, British Columbia and Alberta, if you know where that is. That's like the province that has uh, the city of Vancouver. Oh, okay. uh, there are some incredible ski and snowboarding venues there, like Banff, Whistler, to name a couple. And uh, yeah, it's they're they're pretty they're pretty renowned. So, yeah. yeah Whistler, you've just said that and it's brought back so many memories because as um <clears throat> from a kid, kind of early teens and probably early twenties, I loved mountain biking, particularly downhill mountain biking. And when I was younger, we always used to talk about going to Whistler. Like me and my mates, this this big trip to Whistler, but. <clears throat> I mean, it, it never happened because there's a life, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's, that's the place to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whistler's Whistler's cool. I've been there uh, when I was a kid. Um, but ever since, uh, it's probably been over 10 years since I've, uh, skied oh, or wow. snowboard. Um, yeah, I just got, I got allergic to the weather, I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. it is grueling. Like, I know you say some people love it, but I would get to the point where I, I can't move my mouth and I think, cause it's so mm. numb from how cold it is. And I say, I'm, yeah, done. No. I'm out. It's no joke, you know. Yeah. Yet people still immigrate here. People still come here from very hot climate places in the world, and they uh they adapt. So it's it, it's fascinating, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's fascinating because I guess at the end of the day, even though um the weather is terrible in the winter, um it is still a first world country, which does have uh certain advantages for people who don't come from a, a first world country. Exactly. To be fair, so. Yeah. As much as we complain, it's like uh, first world problems. Yeah. Yeah. Day, so, yeah. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, it's kind of swings and roundabouts. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, there's a lot more pros, aren't there? I guess then. Yeah. Um, so, how does throughout the seasons, how does Canada, does it change quite dramatically? I know it's quite a large country. Mm -hmm. So, where you're from, does it, does it change dramatically throughout the year? 
Yeah, it's hard to say for Canada. It's such a big country. Yeah. It's the second biggest in the world. Uh, so in certain parts, yes, the city I'm from, that's right in the middle of Canada. Right. Um, it would be extremely cold in the winter, like below 30 degrees Celsius with the wind. And then it would be extremely hot in the summer, um, above 30 degrees Celsius oh, wow. um, in the summer and very dry. Yeah. Uh, in the city of Montreal, <clears throat> it can be pretty much the same. Uh, very cold in the winter, very hot in the summer, and very humid because Montreal is actually an island. Um, okay. It's it's completely formed like an island uh, just in the northeastern region, close to the border of uh, the United States, <clears throat> close to uh, New York City. So, yeah. Oh, oh so, wow. Yeah. Okay. So once once it gets to kind of that temperature, what does everyone, is there certain things that everybody likes to do or is it more well, just outside life? Well, yeah, um, the spring around this time, uh, the spring as the weather starts to get nicer, everyone's moods uh, <laughs> really, yeah. really improve. Um, and we we love to get outside and do whatever it is we like to do. For me, it's uh, I like to go outside and play basketball. I used to be a basketball player. Oh, really? So I, um, yeah, I, I go outside to the courts and I try to um, I try to just play some pickup games. It's a, it's a good social activity, mm. good exercise. You get to actually enjoy being outside um because i work so much <laughs> so um yeah, it's uh it's really nice it's really nice yeah so so you say you used to play basketball was that for a team <clears throat> or like a, a certain level or yeah so yeah growing up i played basketball i ended up getting a, a scholarship to go play at a university that's in montreal uh, it's called mcgill university right. so i got a scholarship to play basketball there and then um, afterwards, I played for a summer for uh, Team Canada. Uh, we would travel to uh, Italy, actually, for a, for a basketball tournament. Wow. <clears throat> and then um, we, I also played some three-on-three -three basketball tournaments around the world, too, in China, in Qatar, uh, Doha, Qatar. And wow. uh, it was, yeah, no, it was, it was really fun back in the day when I was in shape. <laughs> when it, <laughs> it was fun when it lasted. Um, now I just play recreationally, um, just to get out. But uh, yeah, it was it was a good basketball career. Looking back on it, um, it was enjoyable. Wow, what an but incredible yeah. experience! Yeah, for sure, definitely. I would. Um, it, it's 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 a very incredible experience. No one can take it away from you. I even to this day, I still look back at the really good times we had in China, um, and places like that. And then you also get the experience of traveling too, which was just cool. a huge bonus. Um, and it really opens your eyes to <laughs> different perspectives, um, in places that are literally backwards <laughs> from the place that you lived your entire life. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I guess that is especially kind of, um, you know, not just traveling for the sense of traveling, but there you're traveling with a purpose, you're traveling for a reason so being involved within that environment in another mm -hmm. country like china it, that that must be such an experience exactly and those two experiences i'll never forget them because i'll probably never experience them again um in those tournaments they were world tournaments so people from all over the world would all be concentrated in one place mm -hmm. and we'd all be staying in like the same hotel so you'd be interacting with a <laughs> person from argentina then a person from mexico then a person from china then a person from japan and you're all just mingling it's like uh it's uh that's probably an experience i'm never gonna ever experience again in my life probably <laughs> being in the wow. same room with people from like a uh, hundred different countries it's yeah. who all play basketball <laughs> yeah so it's, i guess uh, you're all in that room i mean i yeah. guess if you go to a shopping center there's a lot of people there but you don't know if yeah. you've got anything in common but being in a room with that many people that many nationalities knowing that you've all got something in common that must yeah. be pretty cool for sure it's that the, yeah it was a uh, it was a lifetime experience for sure yeah. yeah wow but uh what about you do you play any sports at all um i used to play a bit of football i think just generally <laughs> every kind of british right. like us, football <laughs> you know, like uh soccer football. yeah so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah football yeah. yeah soccer but football um but i was never i was never actually that good at football or sports like that um i was more into skateboarding mountain right. biking snow they were always kind of my 
I probably wasn't really that good at them either, but I preferred it. Mm. Um, but yeah, football, football's the main sport. Used to play five aside with my mates on a Sunday evening, you know, but okay, then nice. as I got older, my ankle started hurting. And yep. My I, Sunday I know evenings, how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now my Sunday evenings are very different. <laughs> Just uh, yeah. early nights and a cup of tea. That's about it. Um, but yeah, and I guess like with experiences like that, there must be some times where you sit back and think that that was sometimes we take it for granted, don't we? The experiences we have in life, we just think, okay, that was part of my life. But I guess once you actually think about it and look back on it, you think, yeah, I'm proud of that. That, that was a really great experience in my life. Yeah, it's it's weird. Like you, you always appreciate it more after the fact. When you're in the heat of the moment, you're you're physically exhausted, you're mentally exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look back at it, you actually uh, are happy that you went through those difficult situations, but still fulfilling situations. So, yeah, for sure. And in university, our coach was he was um, oh my god, uh, <laughs> he was passionate, very passionate. Um, That's if, a nice if way of putting it. If you're doing something that he didn't like, he would he would let you know. Oh He'd really? You know. Yeah, he would not dance around it. He would be very direct. He'd be very blunt. Mm. Um, and some people resented him for that, but looking back at it, um, it actually definitely made us all much tougher people, and probably helped us become more successful in anything else we did in, in mm. life. So um, I actually do appreciate his uh, <laughs> his uh, crudeness, so, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And at the time, though, were you thinking, "Oh, just stop"? You know, I'm trying my best. Like, was it difficult at the time to kind of hear that and go through it? At the time, I ha part of me sort of understood it but then yeah. part of me um did not appreciate the disrespect mm. uh sometimes it was it was very disrespectful <laughs> the right. way the coaches came across but honestly in a sense uh some people kind of need that uh kick in the butt yeah. in order to um in order to kind of shake themselves and um start focusing a little bit harder start trying a little bit harder and start trying to um, have a bit of a sense of urgency to to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so. And I guess, I mean, now, you know, you're working <laughs> really hard. You know, you're, you've got yeah. you'll be doing this on the side. Do you think that kind of work ethic and that tenacity, a lot of it came from that? Absolutely. Oh, really? Wow. Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, coming out of high school to university, it's a tough transition. Um, in high school, usually if you make it to university sports, you're very good in high school. You're one of the best players in high school. And then when you go to university, it usually humbles you. Um, right. It humbles you academically, and then it humbles you um, athletically too. Um, you're going to come into a situation where you're not the best player anymore. And even in school, um, I would say... I probably struggled in some of my classes. I'm coming from high school to university just because I thought a uh, university was much more difficult. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it forces you to overcome it. It forces you to figure out how to get better. Mm -hmm. And then um, you take the necessary actions to improve. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess yeah. you're learning those skills at quite an early age, really coming out of high school, yeah. scholarship, university. You're having, that's a lot of pressure, isn't it? At quite a young age. Yeah, that's good. They, they call it the hidden curriculum in, in oh, university right. it's like um in university you, you'll memorize whatever you need to memorize and regurgitate it on an exam mm -hmm. but it's actually all of these little soft skills that you pick up in university how to read at an advanced level mm -hmm. how to write in an advanced level for things that don't even have to do with the the subject you're studying how to uh, communicate and convey yourself in a certain way even my Perhaps even my English speaking skills as a native English speaker improved just by going through university. And then, of course, the connections you make in university. Um, and that becomes your network afterwards. And you may not really realize that until <laughs> you start crossing paths with people you went to university with after university. Uh, but uh, the, the hidden curriculum, all of those benefits that they don't really market or promote. Um, when trying to get you to go to university, it's actually very valuable. And I think they they should promote that more uh, for people who uh, mm. have the intention of going to university. So, yeah. yeah. Like it's more like life skills, isn't it? And just exactly. kind of growing you as a human on a human yeah. level rather than just, 
words on a piece of paper or being able to take an exam, you know, those mm. life skills that will actually help you in life. Um, exactly. Yeah. That's interesting because I'm not too familiar with how scholarship works because we do have, you know, in England, of course, people do get that, but it's not, I don't think it's as much of a program as it is um, in Canada. I don't know. I might well be wrong on that, but I don't know too many people that go through it. H how does it work with, so of course you're doing your basketball as, as a scholarship and then you, you just kind of go through a standard university along with that process or. Um, yeah, no, they, they just give you a, a certain amount of money to compensate for your expenses going to university. And then, um, yeah, you're, you'll be a student athlete. You need to oh. juggle your courses with, um, your practice schedule, your practice regime. Uh, and it, it's difficult. Uh, it's very okay. difficult. Um, if it was just going through things that were psychologically stressful, I could probably deal with that, but doing mm -hmm things that are mentally stressful and physically stressful simultaneously, that's really difficult. Um, when you get an injury and you can't walk now and you're limping over to, uh, to, to class, I guess, or you're limping over to uh, get an assignment done or do your work, you, you have all these things going on at the same time that are affecting your physical health and your mental health in different directions. Um, yeah, you have you have to be tough. <laughs> yeah, you have to be tough to deal with that. Um, you have to you have to suck it up. You can't uh, you can't break. You can't crack under that uh, under that pressure. So. Yeah, because I guess as well you're thinking, well, I've I've got to make this scholarship work. I've got to make it worthwhile. Yeah, and I didn't really think about that. That actually, I guess normally if your mental level is low, you kind of you can focus on your physical get and kind of balance the two off each other. But if mm. you're working from both levels at a hundred percent all the time that that is that mm -hmm. is tough going yeah yeah you um and it draws a parallel even to learning english and this is what i tell everyone when they when they send me a message on instagram i'll say well what is your purpose for learning english in the first place um because if you don't have a strong enough purpose i honestly don't think you're gonna take the necessary steps to um, achieve your goal of fluency. Most people who attempt to learn English actually fail. <laughs> it's uh, it's yeah. the people who end up succeeding are usually the people who don't give up. The people who end up failing are typically the people who give up too early because they never had the patience to learn the English language in the first place. And that kind of goes for language learning of, of any language, I think. But um, And do you know any other languages? Oh, this is such a, I know a little bit of Spanish, um, right. but if someone wanted to have a conversation with me in Spanish, right. I, um, it wouldn't happen. Uh, but, I, I got by for a little while and then kind of COVID hit, I stopped using it and, and I basically did the opposite to everything I try and teach <laughs> everything right. I try and teach people. <laughs> I just, I, I did the opposite of that. So <laughs> in a way that kind of helped me because I realized what not to do right. when learning a language. What about yourself? Well, yeah, oh, cool. I uh, grew up in the English part of Canada in a mm -hmm. city called Winnipeg. And then I moved over to um, the French part of Canada, which is the city of Montreal. Yep. So then, yeah, in order to work in Montreal, um, I had to learn French. It was difficult. It took me years, like wow. years, maybe five plus years mm -hmm. until I was fluent. And um, I, like you said, I learned a lot of things not to do. <laughs> Yeah, and how to help people um, learn English or any language much quicker than I did. <laughs> yeah, um, and that's that's actually what sparked the entire idea for Arc English. Literally, um, I struggled learning French, and I said, "Wow, I could probably." <laughs> I wish I had a page like mine or any of these other people creating content out here when I um, had to learn French. Uh, so, so yeah. yeah, and I, I guess that comes back to you know you kind of saying that if you're going to learn anything you need a purpose you need yeah. a reason and if you even if you don't know what that purpose or reason is yet find it and i guess for you your purpose was well okay i'm i'm literally going to need this language to get by i'm going to need french to get yeah. by so you had your purpose mm. exactly uh yeah exactly i think it would have been very difficult um without immersion i think you absolutely can become fluent in a language without immersion because of the internet um however i'd be lying if i said it didn't help speed up yes. that process yeah and even then it still took me 
probably five plus years. So if you're if you're someone who's been learning English for a year and you're not perfectly fluent, um, that's probably most people. So don't feel like you're behind <laughs> yeah. or anything like that. It, it's probably most people learning English. It'll most likely take them years before they're quote unquote uh, fluent. Yeah. So yeah. And it is it's true. It's a marathon, isn't it? It's not a sprint. You can't sprint yeah. your way to fluency. You can't, yeah. you know, just you can't rush the process. So I'm really intrigued. You said that kind of that um that learning French is what started Arc English, you know. Yeah. And of course now, um, really on, on social media, Arc English is one of the you know, it's, it's the big names out there, really, in, in learning yeah. social media. You've done amazingly well, considering I just found out that you, you know, this was a side mm. thing. Uh, I, I yeah. really I don't know how you did that. That's incredible. So oh, yeah. just just kind of, I know we spoke about it a little bit, but what was it that made you initially start that? Um, well, yeah, um, I realized a lot of, I, I tried a lot of things in to learn the French language. And I, I include this too. Um, in my email newsletter, I tell stories about my my path to learning French as well. And what went wrong with uh, formal education. And I just saw some gaps and I tried to fill those gaps. Um, it doesn't have to be so complicated. So I tried to seriously like simplify all my videos. If you see my short form videos on the internet, it's incredibly simple, incredibly short. Um, it's just meant to build people's vocabulary. One of the big mistakes that I made to name one that's very noticeable was I would translate words in my head back from English over to French. Right. Um, okay. So it's incredibly, incredibly important that you associate imagery with words, which is what I try to do on Instagram, for example. Mm -hmm. Associate imagery with words and not try to translate it back into your native language. Um, I think that that will help you develop the English side of your brain and actually think in English as opposed to thinking in your native language, because the figure of speech is going to be way different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the grammatical rules are going to be significantly different. Um, so it's it's going to work a lot better if you yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. uh, small things like that, for one example, are gaps that I'm trying to fill. Um, and, and that kind of sparked the idea for the types of videos that I make. Mm -hmm. um, I started doing them. At first, it was slow maybe have like 10 followers, 100 followers eventually. And I was going to other people's pages. I was messaging people saying, I can help you learn, blah, blah, blah. Here's some free advice. This is how you speak better. This is how you read better. Leaving comments on other people's YouTube videos. Here's a free tip, friendly advice, whatever. And um, slowly grew. And um, eventually... Yeah, when when I got to a point where it's between five thousand to ten thousand followers on Instagram, then it just shot up kind of um, once people started to discover it. But it was it was hard, but I it didn't feel like I was working hard just because I I guess I wanted to do it. It was like volunteer work basically. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, that, that's um that's a, that's a quite a different story to mm -hmm. you know I've done I've, I've we've spoken to a few different English mm -hmm. teachers now on this podcast and. That's actually quite a different story because, to be frank and honest, many of us do this because, I'll be honest with you, a lot of us started in yeah. COVID as English yep. teachers. We had no work, so we we did it for the purpose of mm. work, really, as much as, yeah. we loved it, you know. But actually, yeah, for, yeah. for you, this came from a really honest place. This was a very mm. authentic and kind of real thing in the sense of, okay, you know, this is where I went perhaps wrong or this is what I needed. Let me give that to you. Mm -hmm. that, that was kind of where you came from with this yeah exactly um and and yeah and i just gave you the surface level there's yeah. a ton of uh logistics that go behind it in terms oh, yeah. of creating a schedule um being able to i guess facebook uh, pays you a bit to make shorts so then i could use that money to pay a an editor to edit the videos and schedule the videos or something like that there's like a bunch of logistics that go behind it, but um, but yeah, it's that's essentially how it started. And um, right now, I I'm trying to limit my time to how much time I spend on it, to be honest, uh, because I want to focus more on my job. Mm -hmm. But um, 
yeah, I'm still, I, I create a little private community. I still help people. I still give them some private group lessons uh, once a week. Brilliant. Um, very simple. I have uh, some partners as well who also teach in this community. Wow. So um, it's it's a team effort. But uh, but yeah, no, it's it's uh, that that's where I'm at right now. And yeah, I noticed that a lot of people in the space. I've you're one of the many people I've spoken to in the space, and uh, they are they are real teachers. They're real English teachers, and uh, that that makes sense. And I learned a lot from them actually when I uh, <laughs> collabed with them back in the day. Yeah. But it's but funny it's, that term, kind of like real, real English teachers, though. Like, I mean, I have to be honest. Even now, sometimes I don't know how to put this. I don't know how it's going to come across, but I forget I'm an English teacher um, in the sense of you know teaching the language. But as you said, you know, you you kind of you're probably having more effect than a lot of real teachers because you you're coming from a very genuine place, like vocabulary simplicity and that goes a long way um whereas i know sometimes in my head i massively overcomplicate it and it and it kind of i get lost in the complications but i think coming right. back to that kind of authentic approach is it's it's hard because I, I guess yeah. a lot of people learn in different ways um yeah. some people like to learn down to a t <laughs> to every yeah. detail then some people want you to completely dumb it down just make it extremely simple a, B, C, one, two, three. How does this work? How do I do this? What is this called? Um, so it, yeah, it, it's hard. It's hard to tell. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to tell sometimes. People do learn in different ways for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's so true. And, and I guess that's one of the great things with social media now is that yeah. you can learn, not learn a language just from social media, but you can, there's so many different methods and different kind of principles you can take from <clears throat> all these kind of English teachers out there that, you can just absorb so much information in different styles for sure and um it's tricky too because you want to give good teaching methods mm. and sometimes you even want to customize the way that you deliver it but with social media it's a funny thing mm -hmm. if you do not deliver it in a very particular way on social media the algorithms will not push your content to other people um so <laughs> even though you want to do maybe like a, a 30 minute lecture on Instagram or something like that, the algorithm's not going to push it. But then if you, if you're like me and you do a five second, like imagery video, then it gets like 20 million views or something like that mm. on Instagram. It, it's so it's, you have, it's, it's tricky for some of the English teachers because they need to balance mm -hmm. providing value while also appeasing the social media algorithm yeah which can be a challenge it can be tricky yeah it's a weird place social yeah. media especially you know i guess kind of as teachers you kind of have a, a way that you like to impart knowledge or just try and do your best to put it across but you can only do that within the realms of of what the algorithm wants because of course otherwise mm -hmm. it's 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 ultimately a futile exercise you know it's a bit of a waste of time so you you it's kind of, you're right it is getting that that balance yeah. of thinking right this is what i want to put across but yeah. i do have to do it in the way that instagram's gonna gonna like i always describe kind of yeah. or instagram or any social media it's like a really picky friend yeah you know that kind of takes every word you say really sensitively and you've got to yeah. word it all perfectly you know that's kind of what instagram wants yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's tricky, and um, yeah, I, I guess that's just a, a tech savvy thing, I guess. But it's mm. uh, it it is a factor though, for anyone who wants to teach on social media, it's absolutely a factor. You need to take that into consideration. I wish we could all just do our own thing, but you know, you have to um, balance it with uh, what they want to. Yeah, unfortunately. Exactly. And you said did you say before you do you also hold some group classes um yeah. now and then. With those group classes, what have you found to be kind of the most effective approach to helping students or your clients progress? Oh yeah. Yeah, I've tried all sorts of different things. Um <laughs> yeah. when I started out, I was doing like um I was reading English stories with people and then as we came across words they didn't understand, we'd stop and we'd explain the context um i've done things like uh we'd watch videos of conversations like this one even 
and then we'd react and we'd stop and explain context. We'd even um, talk about pronunciation nuances, yeah. um, such as uh, in English, we'll we'll throw words together into one long word sometimes, <laughs> so it doesn't yeah. sound that clear to someone who doesn't speak English as a first language. Um, all sorts of different things. Um, I used to do it uh, just freely way back when in uh, on Facebook, but now I really have limited time. Uh, so I'm really restricting my time to that community now and then charging like a, a very low, intentionally low price um, mm -hmm. just to filter out people who are serious versus people who aren't serious about learning English. And for the people who are serious, they can have my undivided attention uh, during that time. So, that's yeah. yeah, that's yeah, it's so true. And um, yeah. I've noticed like a few times you've kind of you, you've gone back to the idea that contextual learning or giving what you're learning context is essential. Mm -hmm. Like even with vocabulary, you know, you're not looking to translate. You're you're looking to give that word context within your life, so you're you're going to use it. Um, mm -hmm. do you think that is a big part of or for you i guess when you were learning french kind of giving what you were learning context did that help you um yeah french is a tricky one um <laughs> the dynamics of the french language are quite different right the pronunciation of words there's probably 20 words that are, sound exactly the same if you pronounce it right so okay. you have to be very careful um to context uh french it was it's like a complete the basic the basic foundational skills going about learning them i guess it's the same between french and english um but there's just different nuances yeah like right. the figure of speech is quite different mm -hmm. everything in french it does not translate well at all to english yeah. um that was probably the biggest challenge and it's like i mentioned earlier um translating words from English or, or from French back to your native language. Um, that's what screwed me up the most, I think. Oh, okay. Um, I needed to try to think in French, develop the French side of my brain and mm -hmm. associate imagery with French words and um, think and speak and interact like a French person. I was speaking, thinking and interacting like an English person. And I probably still do sometimes to this day. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's like a lifelong thing, <laughs> learning a language, but... Um, <laughs> That's if I could give anyone advice for learning any language, um, that's a really big thing. And it's what I emphasize actually on Instagram, as you can see. So Yeah. 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 Give it give it reason. And you know, that that kind of um, you know, trying to not necessarily just the translation, but that developing that thinking process. Yeah. I guess as you said, you know, I, I do still try and learn Spanish now, but mm. it doesn't ever stop. Um, even as a, a native English speaker and teacher i'm always learning something about the language mm -hmm. or i hear a word and i think never heard that before <laughs> or mm -hmm. you know even words that i realized i've been pronouncing a little bit incorrectly so it's just a an ongoing process but i guess the biggest part is making sure that you you just still enjoy it relax yeah. and, and just go through the motions of learning a language sure absolutely and um i'm not sure if you've ever tried the app it's, there's an app called link um, it's, it's so do you know who Steve Kaufman is the polyglot who knows tons of different languages yeah uh, Steve Kaufman yeah. yeah he um he created this app okay. uh, with an app developer called link you it's 100% free I recommend oh. it to my audience too but it's um it's really good I use it I, I'm trying to dabble in Spanish too I, hey. I'm not fluent yeah. at all in Spanish <laughs> but yeah. I'm trying to dabble in it and um, I've been using it for Spanish and it's, it's quite good. Um, you just put your level yep. of the language. So I'll say my level of Spanish is absolute beginner. Mm -hmm. It'll feed me content that's at my level. Um, and then you can push an audio button and it'll actually read this short story out loud to you. So oh. you can read along. You can listen to it, you can shadow it, and actually exercise your mouth to practice speaking. Mm -hmm. And then um, you don't have to look up any words that you don't know. You just click on it, and then the definition pops up oh. as you're going along. So it's just like, uh, it's very efficient. 
And then if you, I just try to do like one of those every day before I go to bed or something. Yeah. And then depending on how serious you are about learning the language, you can just choose how frequently or non-frequently you um you practice. Right. And that's yeah. called Lin Q. Is that right? Yeah, Lin-Q. like L I N G uh, Q, like question. Okay. Lin Q. But, oh, I'll put the yeah, link for, in the bio. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah, they yeah they got yeah. all sorts of languages there too. It's wow. a bunch of different languages you can learn. So yeah. And I think anything that gets you to speak out loud is is essential. Mm-hmm. I, I say this to all of my students. You probably do as well, or anyone you're kind of trying to help. That you've got to get the muscles moving. You've yeah. got to get your mouth moving in a way that it needs to for the language that you are learning. Mm-hmm. And if you, there's an app that can help you do that, you know, without having to think about what am I going to say, who am I going to talk to, mm-hmm. there's yeah, there's an app that can help you do that. Um, I do have a question. When you were learning, I'm always intrigued to know mm-hmm. when you were learning French. Did you found, did you find, sorry, that films and TV helped you? watching me in the language or oh that's a controversial topic it is <laughs> and i'm always intrigued to know because it is, uh, it is controversial uh so i okay so in my opinion i do not recommend tv shows and movies to mm-hmm. learn a language i recommend podcasts and realistic conversations and interviews such as the one we're having right now mm-hmm. um as opposed to tv shows and movies the reason being in TV shows and movies, there are oftentimes very dramatic sequences that you will never experience in real life. And a lot of the things you learn, it's cool to understand and listen, but um, it's not a good example of how you should necessarily convey yourself in a real life situation. Now, some of them, yes, the actors do a good job of making it seem real, mm-hmm. but for dramas, and for crazy action films, for Marvel movies like the Avengers, yeah. uh, I I don't think that's going to help your conversation skills as much as picking up on how two native English speakers like you and I are speaking yeah. to each other right now naturally. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Recommend real conversations. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I think, yeah, yeah okay, if you want to practice your listening skills while, <laughs> while chilling in an evening, you're like watching Avengers, that's great. But you... Yeah. You know, listening to Thor talk about something isn't. If you go yeah. into an English conversation trying to sound like Thor, <laughs> it's not going to yeah. go down well. But you're right. The focus should should be on genuine, real kind of conversations. Mm-hmm. And now, I mean, not just this one, but there's. I mean, I say well, I'm just a little fish in a big pond. But there's there's so many great, authentic, real conversations through podcasts on YouTube that, as you say, you can come away with something that you can actually use or that you can mm-hmm. actually kind of put into practice absolutely absolutely and um what actually helped me learn how to speak french believe it or not <clears throat> i tell this to people too you can make a ton of progress on your own you not necessarily need to have conversations with another native speaker um you having conversations with yourself you you can literally make a ton of progress uh with your conversation skills um the easiest way to do it <clears throat> is just pull up a YouTube video, anything you're interested in that's in the English language. It could be one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. Uh, listen to it. Um, after you're done listening to it, just express your opinion about what you just watched. Do I agree? Do I disagree? How did this make me feel? Try your best to express um, how you felt about what you just watched. Um, and you can type it too with spell check. You can see where your spelling mistakes are. Um, you can write it out first and then speak it. Um, and then you just, when you're in the shower and you get up in the morning and you go to bed at night, just recite it. Just train your mouth to just speak as if you're speaking to an imaginary friend, as if you're speaking yep. um, to a real person. Just express it like you would in a conversation. Mm-hmm. And then when you come into a real conversation and someone asks you your opinion, you already got a bunch of repetitions expressing your opinion and it's going to feel way more natural. It's going to feel like second nature. You're not going to be stumbling. You've already done it a hundred times on your own. So, there you go. I, I think that is brilliant advice. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, you, I think a lot of people sometimes, or I know I've done it with Spanish, think, oh, I don't have anyone to talk to, so I won't. Um, yeah. I'll just go back to what I normally do, which is a bit of Duolingo, a bit of 
vocabulary learning and that's it. But as you say, you know, just just talk to yourself, get talking. Yeah. And it's just it's just getting in the habit <clears throat> of doing that. And you say mm -hmm. express your opinion and just get used to the mm -hmm. idea of formulating thoughts in the language that you are learning. Mm -hmm. um, I know my wife and I, when we I say learn in Spanish, really mm -hmm. loosely mean that. <laughs> when we yeah. were trying to we had times where so at dinner it, we never really spoke much because we would we would say right we're only going to speak in spanish just mm. for this next 20 minutes just while so it'd be quite a silent 20 minutes to be honest <laughs> but that was <laughs> yeah. the intention was good that we were going to just speak in spanish but that idea you know of just at home get talking i think that is such good advice it's brilliant it's absolutely valuable yeah and, and because we're giving advice i should just put this huge disclaimer <laughs> um this is not going to work overnight if you don't see if you do if you're listening to this mm -hmm. video and if you do this for a week and you're not fluent like this is not gonna you're yeah. not gonna see major results overnight doing this i did this maybe for like consistently consistently every day for maybe a year like 365 wow. days mm -hmm. and i saw a very noticeable improvement but like this is not going to happen overnight though um mm -hmm. you need to be consistent even if it's just a little bit even if it's minimal like just do it every day, um, make it a part of your lifestyle. Um, and you will absolutely see results inevitably. It's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when. So, yeah. so how so. did you, how did you keep that consistency? Cause I mean, that, cause that's often, I think the, one of the most challenging parts is, is keeping consistent. How, how did you manage to do that? Oh, um, I just psyoped myself. <laughs> I basically tricked myself yeah. into being very interested in French media and French culture. Mm. To be honest, like the more I learned French, the less I like it. <laughs> I don't, I prefer English culture, like over, yeah. over French culture, to be completely honest. Um, but I, I, I guess I just got really into it. Um, I, I tried to just consume French media I tried to um, understand how French people communicate with their sense of humor. Yeah. Um, on YouTube, I'd pick my favorite French YouTubers Brilliant. and then I would uh, watch their videos yeah. then react to that. I just try to find subjects that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So that could usually overcompensate for me not liking the language if that's the case in some cases. Um, but if, if you, yeah, if you listen to things that you're really interested in naturally, if I'm listening to something about basketball or an yeah. anime show that I liked watching or what, what, whatever it is, um, it's far easier to um, watch it from beginning to end. Yeah. And um, that leads me to another common mistake that people make is they listen to content that is too difficult for them. It's, it's beyond their level of English. Um, if you're listening to a video or a show where you cannot understand over 50% of what the people are saying, I think you're wasting your time. I think it's going to be extremely frustrating. You're going to have to look up words every two seconds and it's going to be extremely inefficient and you will not make very good progress. Um, I think you should be listening to content where you can understand at least like around 80% of what is being said and then you can fill in the gaps and use your judgment to figure out what the other 20 percent of the words mean based on the context mm -hmm. um that's going to be way more efficient and way more helpful if you can do that consistently and slowly build yourself up and mm -hmm. slowly build your vocabulary up that way but if you're listening to something where you can barely understand um you're you're wasting your time you, you will not get better doing that um it's it's going to be extremely frustrating uh, yeah. I'm doing I did it with French and I did it a lot with French and um I I was just confused. Yeah. <laughs> confused about what people were saying, what things actually meant, um, because I was listening to stuff where I didn't truly even understand most of it. So and I guess in turn then that that creates quite a negative process. <laughs> yeah. Because you get you got you're creating frustration, you're you're perhaps feeling a little bit disappointed in yourself because you're not yeah. understanding things, but <laughs> And I think one of the biggest reasons people do that, well, yeah, I probably did the same in Spanish, is because someone told me to watch this. 
oh, watch this, watch yeah. that. Or if you can, if you can watch yeah. this, then if you can understand this, then you're good. But actually, no, just, just on a personal level, mm -hmm. do it for yourself. You know, if you watch something yeah. where you're going to understand it, you're going to enjoy it. Not just because someone told you to, but yeah, and, that, and then that's you can progress. For sure. And that's one of the hundred reasons why it took me like over five years to become fluent in French. Mm -hmm. That's one of like, <laughs> I made every mistake in the book, yeah. any mistake that any language learn made, I, I made it 20 yeah. times over. That's why it took me so long. Like, uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. oh, uh, cool. take that in. Uh, when I'm giving this advice, keep that in mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've made every, every mistake in the book. That's where my advice comes from. That's why I can say it with conviction because, um, yeah. I've done it. But well, that's what really makes you a valuable asset in this this environment is because you, you've been there and I've learned from my mistakes. And like you said, I, I guess it's anything, even if you're training, whether that's for a sport or in the gym, consistency yeah. is the key. You're not going to see gains overnight. You're not going to see it just mm. consistent, stick with it. And as you said, it's the same with learning a language. Just be consistent. Mm. And I guess to a certain extent, hold yourself accountable. You know, mm. you're, be, be accountable for learning English and, and do it for yourself. Brilliant. For sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you Absolutely. so much, Avery. I really appreciate yeah. you joining me. That was, um, yeah, some brilliant insights there. And I'm sure everybody will really enjoy, you know, and take yeah. something away from that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. No, absolute pleasure. Maybe we can do it again sometime. For sure. I'm always open. You know, you know yeah. how to contact me and, uh, yeah, I love doing it. I have fun. I enjoy doing these. So, um, for sure. Anytime. Brilliant. Thank you, mate. Have a great weekend. You too.